fact, we're very indebted to Dave that he was willing to tackle the topic altogether. His topic is problem sets of failure and learning, because so far in the series, very little attention has been paid to the whole topic of problem sets. And in general on campus, you probably notice not much attention is paid to the topic of failure. So we applaud his bravery in being willing to talk about both of these things. And failing. <laughs> so, but I do want first to draw your attention to the second and final talk in the series for this year, which will feature for the first time not a Stanford Teaching Award winner, but an award winner from the discipline. And that will be Professor Eric Kuhl of Chemistry, who will talk about how can organic chemistry possibly be interesting, one teacher's answer. And I don't know about you, but I'm burning to know that answer. <laughs> and I think a lot of students on campus would like to know it too. But I now would like to introduce Professor David, or Dave Freiberg, whom I've had the pleasure of knowing for many, many years as one of Stanford's most dedicated and effective teachers. Dave received an AB in Engineering Science, magna cum laude with distinction, and a Bachelor's in Environmental Engineering, both from Dartmouth in 1972. For three years after that, he went into industry and worked as a project engineer and a project manager in the area of water resources for the Anderson Nichols and Company. I don't know if Dave's love of water had predated that first job, but in 1975, he left industry and came here to Stanford, finishing first a master's and then a PhD in hydrology, hydraulics, and hydromechanics, and he thereby launched a career dedicated to the study and management of subsurface water under unpredictable circumstances such as arid and semi-arid areas. And I somehow imagine that his concern for modeling and understanding water under these circumstances is not unrelated to the patience and the interest that he has shown in student learning under, uh, under equally unpredictable, and dare I say, sometimes even semi-arid circumstances. So Dave started as an assistant professor at Stanford in 1980, even before he completed his PhD, and won a prestigious NSF Presidential Young Investigator Award in 1985. In 1988, he accepted an assignment as associate dean for undergraduate education in the School of Engineering and was a conscientious and effective student advocate in the dean's office for the next four years. Active in his field as well as on campus, he is past chair of the National Research Council's Water Science and Technology Board, and he is also a co-author of the widely used textbook water resources engineer. But we've invited him here today for his teaching, which has been recognized by not just one, but two major awards, the School of Engineering's Tau Beta Pi Award and the 1994 Bing Fellowship for Teaching Excellence. And I also have to note that I noticed on Dave's CV, as I have not noticed on other CVs, that among his research interests, he lists pedagogy, uh, engineering pedagogy. So thank you, Dave. That's terrific. And it's an honor to welcome him today and introduce him to you. Well, I, I am truly delighted to be here. Um, I'm delighted to have an opportunity to um, discuss and perhaps even debate uh, with you pedagogy. Um, I happen to believe that uh, our fundamental business here is learning, whether it's our own learning or our students' learning uh, or societal learning, learning in the broader sense. Uh, and it's nice, it's a welcome opportunity to sort of take a breath and uh, actually um, have a conversation about what it is I think we really do here or try to do here or should try to do here. Now, uh, my hope uh, today is that this can actually be a conversation about learning, or about at least some 
uh, particular aspects of learning. Uh, I, I'm not going to attempt to provide either a polished or an erudite discussion of learning uh, or of failure or of the other things that were in my titles. Rather, I'm hoping that I can say enough to get you um, irritated or provoked uh, and that we might then have a discussion about some of the issues that I'd like to uh, raise with you. Uh, what, I, what I decided to do was to, and when Michelle asked me to participate and to come up with a topic, um, uh, why she that actually caught me at the end of winter quarter, and I'm always pretty um, out of it by the end of the quarter, and I, was, I wasn't quite sure what I should talk about, that I could... Um, uh, it would be sort of fun to talk about. Uh, but then it occurred to me that this would be a great chance to talk about sort of one of my uh, current pedagogical dilemmas. Uh, and so that's really the motivation for this, is that I sort of have this running list of dilemmas uh, related to learning and teaching. And uh, I'm in the midst of trying to cope with one right now. And so I thought I would get some help uh, and, and sort of give you a sense of what I'm struggling with, and maybe you can help me figure out what to do about it. Uh, I'm also interested in understanding, for my own benefit, the degree to which my problems are universal problems, or whether they are, uh, say, discipline-specific or personality-specific. So uh, there's another benefit for me to have uh, you here today. So uh, as I advertised, uh, the particular aspect of learning that I'd like to uh, uh, get a conversation going about is the role of failure. And uh, how does the notion of failure uh, fit into a notion of pedagogy, a notion of teaching and learning? Now, I think to help you understand why I'm thinking so much about failure these days, uh, besides my many failures at pedagogy and teaching and learning, uh, is that um, I, I, I think you need some context to sort of see uh, from where this comes, and that's partly disciplinary, and I suspect you have a, a broad set of backgrounds. And so uh, some of you will be bored, but I, I would like to give you a sense of why failure is on my mind uh, from the point of view of, of what I actually do uh, teach. So... Um, I am in an engineering department, civil and environmental engineering, and so it's no surprise that my teaching focuses on the sciences that underlie my particular engineering field, which is indeed water resources, so um, how we use water and how our use of water interacts with the natural behavior of water in the environment. And, and there's a science that underlies that, hydrology, and so I am also a hydrologist, and I teach courses on that underlying science. But I also spend a lot of time uh, teaching and thinking about teaching engineering, uh, and water resources engineering in particular, but engineering uh, more broadly defined, in fact. Now, I would argue that the the fundamental distinguishing characteristic of engineering, broadly defined, and I mean that both as an intellectual activity and as a professional activity, uh, is design, is the process of design. And so to understand my focus on failure, you need to understand my focus on design. Uh, the design, to my way of thinking and to others, I, I'm, uh, this is... Um, my ideas have certainly been formed by uh, talking with and reading and thinking with other people about these issues. Design is a very different process uh, than discovery. So we think of so the sciences being defined by the discovery process, and engineering is the really defined by the design process, and they work almost entirely oppositely. So um, in science, we go out and we take the real world, the physical, chemical, biological world, and we attempt to understand it. We, tend to dis we try to discover how it works and distill how the real world works into a set of <coughs> concepts, into a conceptual framework that allow us to articulate our understanding of that world. Design 
we take that conceptual understanding of the world, so we start with that conceptual understanding of the world, uh, and then we couple it with desire. All right? um, so I'm trying to use words that might provoke. So um, just so you, you didn't know, I just want to tell you. Um, and by desire, I mean that we have a conceptual notion of something that we want or need. So engineering starts with a fantasy of how we would like the world to be. Right? And then we take what we know about how the real world works, which has been abstracted for us nicely by the sciences, and we take our perception, our understanding of a need or a want or a desire, and we somehow combine those two conceptual frameworks and we turn them into a reality. So that's a very different process, and it involves different skills. And I would argue that the sort of fundamental knowledge base, sort of the epistemology of engineering, and Walter Vincenti has helped me think about this a lot, that is that this notion of knowing how to take a, con a concept of both what we want and what we need and a concept of how the world works and somehow bring those together to create something that will accomplish a task, will meet a need, uh, will fulfill a desire in the real world. So we sort of create the physical out of the conceptual instead of the other way around, which is to start with the physical and turn it into a conceptual. Now, if you look at how design works, and many, many people have, and I, I teach one uh, course that has a focus on design, and one of my favorite things to do is to start off, and, and I, have, I have sort of 30 different images, sort of little flow charts of how design works. And engineers in particular love to make flow charts of how design works. And of course, in fact, the whole point of design is that you can't make a flow chart of it. So there's a certain irony there. In, in trying to talk about design and to talk about it in a structured way. But a key characteristic, it's very clear that no matter what field we're looking at, the matter the, na the, so the scope of the problem, a key failure in the design process is failure. <coughs> and understanding, one of the things engineers learn how to do as engineers, and I mean this both, again, as an intellectual activity as well as a professional activity, is they learn how to use failure as part of the design process. It is essential to it. And it's because we are, in fact, moving from the abstracted to the concrete. And the concrete is always more complicated than the abstracted. And so one can't make perfect predictions. We can't make perfect predictions about people. And people are dominantly the users of designed, engineering designed items uh, or the environment or the, uh, we can't predict that aspect of it and we can't typically predict all aspects of the performance of a product, of an artifact, to use the, the sort of academic word that gets used. So what engineers learn how to do is how to design and with the concept of failure and testing and experimentation. So there's a set of skills associated with design that are based on this notion that we can't predict perfectly ahead of time. We can't design to an abstract concept and on the first shot end up with a, uh, the most effective, efficient, optimal artifact. We're going to have to go some, through some sort of iterative process. So that's why we have R and D. Okay? The D part, which is the part that people <coughs> have the hardest time understanding. We all research, we all sort of have a concept, but this R and D, research and development. Well, part of that development process is about dealing with the fact that we can't do <coughs> it perfectly and that we're going to have failures occurring. And what we want to do is we want to confine the space in which those failures occur. We would rather not have the failures occur after we've marketed our product and people are using it. We would rather not have, in my business, in, which is largely public infrastructure, we really don't want dams to fail or bridges to fail uh, or buildings to fail. Um, that's not good. And good engineers don't design ones <laughs> to fail. Um, however, failure happens. And so the question is, how do you manage that process? In many cases, there is a cycle 
that is dependent on these tools that we tend to learn at school, mathematical models uh, and uh, the, the idea of prototypes and, and learning how to do experiments and the notion of experiments not to discover how the world works but rather to discover how an artifact performs and how it can be improved or how it can be fixed. That process is the process that we learn as designers. Now, in the public world, there is a pattern that's been observed by a number of, of people looking at how uh, engineer, in sort of in a general way, how designed, uh, the sort of the design cycle functions. And I, I'll use a, 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 a sort of a classic example that many of you probably know about, um, which is bridge failure. And, and you've, uh, many of you have probably seen that nifty video of uh, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which was a suspension bridge that uh, it, it finally failed under wind stresses. It was, and it ended up called Galloping Gertie because it looked like this. So imagine the Golden Gate Bridge going like this, and it eventually failed. And that's a good example of this process, this secular process that uses uh, failure as part of the design process. Because typically what we do is we design, and if we know relatively little, because we know failure is a possibility, we build in lots of factors of safety. So we have what would be called a conservative design, because we don't know whether we even understand how something might fail. So we over-design the thing and is, are as conservative as we can be to keep the thing standing. And that wasn't galloping gurdy. That was early bridges that were massive structures that are still standing uh, uh, <coughs> centuries later because they were, in some sense, conservatively designed. But what happens is we design something conservatively, and it works, and it keeps working. And so we go, ah, we over-design. We can do better than that. We can save money. We can save time. We can make it look better. So we'll back off a little bit. We'll trim a little bit here. We'll trim a little bit there. We'll make it look a little bit fancier. And we keep doing that, and it keeps working. And so we say, good, we can keep doing more. And we keep trimming and, and, and getting it better and tuning it in until finally something happens that we hadn't expected. So in the case of suspension bridges, we, kept, we made them very stiff originally. We kept making them less stiff and less stiff, and they still started working until we built one in an area with high winds, high crosswinds. And it turns out if you don't have a stiff deck and you have high winds, you get a galloping suspension bridge. And it failed. It failed because the designers hadn't considered an important design parameter because it hadn't been something that we worried about until then. So all of a sudden, all suspension bridges were redesigned. We went back to a conservative design. And now we're trimming back again and, and sort of going down another avenue of optimizing after having gone through a rather spectacular failure and a very public failure that fortunately didn't cost a lot of lives. That's not always the case. So there is this process of design, <coughs> failure, and improvement that hopefully goes on in private, but sometimes goes on in public. But that is the essence of engineering design, in my opinion. And that's one of the things that I'm interested in teaching. But it also, um, I would argue that there are very significant parallels between engineering design and learning. And so that's what that whole preamble uh, was, is to try to make the case that I would argue that there is lots of evidence to suggest that at least for some people and some settings and some material, some information, that there are real parallels between the fundamental role, the essential role of failure. I mean, you think about it. In this country growing up, and one of the first things I can remember my parents saying to me when I went off to school is, you know, learn from your mistakes. I mean, we all, we learn from your mistakes. Learn from your mistakes. That's, that's a, a shibboleth that we all hear. Um, and what happens, of course, is <coughs> that we get to school and we aren't supposed to make mistakes. And that's actually what I want to talk about. It turns out there is evidence, there's actually research-based evidence that, that really shows or demonstrates that, again, at least within some subsets of knowledge uh, and some sets, uh, subsets of individuals and, and individual um, um, psychologies, that, that 
incorporating new information into one's conceptual map, to incorporating understanding and turning it into something that is a functional part of your knowledge. So in other words, turning information into knowledge in many situations requires either use or repetition. Right? And use in such a way that you find out the utility of that information by trying it out. And so I think that the process of learning in many areas, uh, in fact, can, uh, is in sometimes most effective and is most enhanced if it has in the process a process of, if you will, failure. Right? A process of trying something out, not having it work so well, and then having to fix it. Now, I, I, it's... Um, Interesting, and, and to me it's um, ironic that on the one hand we do have processes, for example in many writing courses uh, it's assumed that you will do a first draft and you will turn the first draft in and you'll get comments back and you will fix it. But I haven't, there, there, we don't find nearly as many examples of a process that attempts to incorporate failure um, in many other aspects of academia, and many other areas of teaching. So I think, in fact, that we create an environment, and I see this, again, I, most closely in my own field, so in engineering and the sciences, uh, we create an environment that, in fact, creates fear of failure during learning. Now, fearing failure during professional practice is a, a good fear, all right? But I'm not sure that fearing failure during learning uh, is a very good way to be running academia. And so I wanted to, that's what I really want to talk about. And my targets, my, my, and I think we'll have, there are many others, but my, my particular target uh, is problem sets. Okay? Uh, and I'll throw exams in there as well because I think they're coupled together. And so let me uh, give you a specific example. I mean, the, the obvious pops into your mind. Um, uh, but the manifestation I'm interested in is what I, can, what I call the sort of the traditional problem set cycle, all right, which is uh, I lecture on a topic for a week or so, and then I hand out a problem set. You start working on the problem set, which is due in a week or two later, so now you're off working on the problem set of the stuff that I've already stopped lecturing on because I've now moved on to the next topic. You're off working on that problem set. It takes you a week or so. You hand it in. It now takes me or the TA, another week or so to grade it. All right, so you get it back uh, well along in the quarter, well past when we're talking about it in class. And the traditional pattern, and I've act I actually tested this, the traditional pattern is that you get it back and if it says, oh, 19 out of 20 or you know, 49 out of 50 or 50 out of 50 or you know, looks good or check mark, whatever it is, you get it and you file it away. Ah, I did okay. I got it all right. Everything is fine. All right? If you get it back and it's full of red ink, then you worry about it, but you're so busy worrying about the new problem set that you're now working on that you, in fact, never go back and actually try to incorporate all that red ink that somebody spent a lot of time trying to provide the feedback. So the feedback loop doesn't get closed. You're too busy. Uh, the timing isn't right. The temporal pattern is stretched way out. So we create a system in which we either tell you you need to get everything right on your problem sets, and if you don't get something right, we know you're not going to look at it anyway because the system is set up so you don't have time to do it. So I'm not convinced that problem sets lead to a lot of learning. They certainly involve repetition, that aspect of learning, but the value that could be obtained by a, a more iterative process of really trying to use knowledge, not trying to reproduce the example problem in the text, but trying to actually use that knowledge and perhaps not succeeding, but having some way of integrating and feeding back that failure into the educational process would be much, much more effective. I tried, I've been trying uh, via some experimentation, uh, and there are a few victims in the room, um, uh, to try to break that cycle to some degree uh, by saying, well, let's try something a little different. Let's have 
Um, problem sets that I always religiously call exercises because I genuinely think of them as exercises uh, and have almost no turnaround time. Have them be short, have them be fast. So I will hand out uh, an, an exercise on, say, Wednesday that's due on Friday, and we will discuss that in class on Friday. Right, so restructure the classroom time so that there is an immediate discussion of the problem set material, breaking that temporal pattern and allowing uh, the feedback process to occur while we've just been done talking about it in class, you've just worked out on the problem set, and there it is. So that is one strategy that uh, would attempt to break that pattern that cuts out the failure and learning process. Um, generally speaking, that, that strategy has failed. So um, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, I thought that was a great idea, but I am now, after trying it for a while, I'm convinced that it doesn't work so well, and I want to talk about why. Um, but let me say a little comment about exams then. Um, and uh, uh, my, my intention is to get done here in time to have some conversation. Uh, the other piece <coughs> of this learning uh, puzzle and this failure in feedback is, of course, the role of exams. Uh, the instructors in the room know how fulfilling it is to grade a final exam and really try to correct it and, and give feedback on it and then realize that the students don't even pick it up the next quarter when they come back. Um, and so there is no feedback loop in most exams. We offer an exam and we use it as a test, but it isn't used as part of a um, uh, directly as a learning process in many cases. And again, I think it is this, we create this atmosphere of not failing. One of the interesting things I attempted, or I, I think it was interesting, um, but again, I'm not sure it worked, uh, was to um, establish from the very beginning of the quarter that the final exam would in fact cover exactly the same material that's on the exercises. So the atmosphere, you have exercises, you're free to fail on the exercises. The point is to be able to uh, do better on the final. But you'll see the same thing. So in other words, to try to create a feedback loop that, that says, OK, uh, focus on these exercises, look at them as exercises, and when you take the exam, the exam is going to cover the same material. And that's your chance to, to have learned from trying once and being able to demonstrate a second time that you have learned from whatever failure may or may not have occurred during the first time through. So and there are many other ways you can think of to try to integrate exams into the learning process and to better integrate problem sets, but those are two particular ones. And now the, the, the part where I get to talk about my failure is that I actually think, for the most part, those attempts and other attempts I've made to try to deal with this fear of failure have largely failed. <laughs> and and I, this is where I really need advice, uh, and, and, and I would like you to think about this with me a little bit. But let me give you a sense of some of the feedback I get uh, and some of the issues that I think have come up in my uh, attempts uh, and uh, recognizing that, uh, as always, there are always issues of particular implementations and the way I did it, and I'm not sort of setting this up as, as a, a broad generalizable experience, but it has led me to get feedback uh, and to think more and read more about this process to understand why trying to eliminate the fear of failure has failed. Right? At least I'm not afraid of failing. Um, one of them, interestingly enough, there's one interesting pattern that has come out now uh, after several years, and that is an interesting temporal pattern. These, the kinds of things I've described work very well with first quarter freshmen. Right? They fail miserably with seniors, at least in the courses I teach. Seniors hate them, freshmen love them. 
interesting. You might want to, you know, I, one can think about why that might be. But it, it's one reason it tends for me to think that the problem might be here, all right? Not in, we can't blame this on K through 12, all right? Although I have a K through 12 blame coming, but uh, we can't blame it on K through 12 uh, because at least in my very small subsample, all right, no statistical honesty here, it's just very small subsample, but my experience has been that Younger, newer students, uh, if I can get them, and in fact, it actually makes a difference between fall and spring, all right, in first year. But if we do this fall quarter, freshman year, it seems to work. Now, maybe I just get along better with first quarter freshmen, but the fact of the matter is that these attempts at dealing with failure and incorporating uh, an environment in which failure is okay, as long as it's viewed as a learning process, all right, that seems to work. But it really, it really sort of reaches its low point uh, with seniors. It kind of starts back up again with graduate students, all right? But the real low point is with seniors. All right. Now, I can think of reasons for that, but so can you. So we'll talk about that. Um, so that, that's one observation about it. Uh, another observation is that is an issue of trust. When I, and I've, I've, well, I've checked this actually fairly carefully, when I announce, right, at the beginning of the quarter that, okay, there's going to be a final exam, and the final exam is going to cover the material on the exercises, not any other material, it's going to be very much like the material in the exercises. If you understand the exercises, you'll do well in the final. And uh, I haven't interviewed every single person in every single class, but from looking at written anonymous feedback as well as discu individual discussions, I've had a striking number of conversations after the final with students who said, we didn't believe you. <laughs> you know? Now, I, perhaps I'm inherently untrustworthy, um, and I will accept that. But I've heard this from other people. I don't think it's just me. But we, somehow in the system, all right, we, somehow we've created an environment where we don't believe things like that. We're certain that the final is going to trick us. All right? The goal of the final is to you know, hook us up somehow, to get us in trouble. And it is, in fact, going to cover something that we haven't talked about in class yet or we haven't uh, done on a problem set. So there is an element of trust. It's an interesting element of trust here that I think we've lost for some reason. I don't know whether we ever had it. I guess I shouldn't say I don't know. But I, I have a sense that it's not enough. So you can't explain this. All right? I, at least I have not been successful in explaining my, this approach, this issue. Uh, and I do that. I'm explicit. Um, I haven't been successful in explaining it in such a way that, in fact, I'm trusted about it. I find you know, that's, that's really interesting. Um, the other interesting thing is that uh, since I have uh, started using, trying these ideas out uh, in my teaching evaluations, the one place where I really have, I just gotten, the change has been night and day, uh, is that I am bitterly accused of, um, of eliminating incentives, of not being positively reinforcing and not um, uh, being positive enough in feedback, which I find really interesting because I actually give more positive feedback, at least in terms of counting the number of positive comments I've heard on exercises. But there is a notion here of somehow failure is connected to self-esteem and it's connected to enthusiasm. So it often, this gets connected up with enthusiasm for the material if there is a perception of failure. And I, I need advice here. I would like to figure out how to get around that and to find a way to, uh, in fact, um, create an environment in which using failure as a learning tool, uh, not trying to make failure a way of life, but making failure, making, trying, pushing oneself beyond what you can get by plugging into the example in the book, pushing out there and using new knowledge to somehow create an environment that is, is supportive enough so that we um, don't damage self-esteem, uh, but allows this process 
to function, to work. And I, uh, I obviously haven't succeeded in doing that. Um, and uh, I, I can think of lots of other possible um, things that are going on, and it's very much a function of a lot of dynamics. But I think this is, my bottom line is, I think this is really hard to do. Um, and uh, I haven't figured out how to do it yet, but I am really curious to, find, to, to understand more why the notion that a protected environment in which to fail with lots of feedback uh, how we can create that environment so that we, in fact, can have more learning. We, I mean, and I, I'm <coughs> confident there's enough data to indicate that, that, in fact, there is more learning in that kind of setting. I, I'm quite confident about that, at least, in, again, in some areas. So I think we have an obligation to try to work on this. And so I'm going to be quiet for a second, if it's possible, uh, and see if you have any ideas uh, that might uh, contribute to this or see whether this is consistent at all with your experiences. Am I, I may be an outlier here, but uh, this is my current pedagogical dilemma, uh, and uh, I'm anxious to see what you think. Ed, I knew you'd think something. <laughs> David, how did you decide that these attempts had failed? Well, by failure, I mean short-term in terms of short-term feedback. I have not been doing it long enough to know what the long-term uh, perception will be. So this, this opens up the other, the other whole question of how we assess learning. Uh, and I, I intentionally stayed away from that. I'm happy to go into that. <laughs> uh, but I, I, am, I am thinking in terms of short-term um, uh, perceptions and short-term feedback and even, I mean, um, to some degree, uh, since I have the luxury of teaching courses that are in sequences, <laughs> so I sort of see what happens, <laughs> uh, I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I have a, a nagging worry that, in fact, it's not just short-term uh, or, you know, immediate perception of the experience, but rather that there may, that there really is um, uh, a dilemma here. Because, for one thing, this kind of, a, of, of focus um, does... For, in my case, it has reduced the amount of material I can cover, for example. I spend much more time in class uh, discussing things. Uh, and so in the, in the classic engineering sense of, you know, here is a big chunk of material that's going to get forced down uh, the throat. Uh, why I, you know, in that sense also, uh, I've traded things off. And, and I'm still trying to understand. Um, I, I'm, I'm sounding more pessimistic than I am. I, I continue to believe that the basic notion is right. I'm just not sure I'm implementing it very well. Yes? Uh, what you say resonates with my experience a lot. <coughs> As I was listening to you, I was trying to figure out how could I apply this in some kind of way to a course that I teach for uh, freshmen and sophomores, Introduction to Urban Studies, where I have four assessments through the, through the quarter. <coughs> I have this problem of the feedback loop. But it occurs to me that I could take the writing in the major model and add a, uh, at each of those four assessments, like early on, a one-page paper on an urban problem. Second assessment, a two-page paper on the same urban problem, but mm -hmm. better mm -hmm. and improved based on what you've learned in the course so far. Mm -hmm. At the third assessment, a three-page paper. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. Final exam, four-page paper, same topic, but now with incorporated learning. Mm -hmm. I like. I mean, I like. I think the notion that somehow learning is a one-pass process is. I don't see any data that indicate that that's true. I mean, it's a multi-pass process, um, and you're right. We we, we usually avoid that. Um, focusing on time. that's an interesting idea. I, I like that idea. One of my victims. One of, one of the victims. Um, <laughs> I wonder what about a, like a combination approach, uh, mm -hmm. similar to what the gentleman was talking about, but the grading is sort of scaled up. Mm -hmm. So as you know, your first failures are not counted very much against you, but as you improve your assignment or your exercise, the grading is, you know, how, how much it's weighted is increased. It seems like you get sort of the best of mm -hmm. both worlds. The students are happy because they get the feedback, and you also give them a chance to fail. Yeah, well, grading is another whole issue which I didn't bring up, and it certainly dovetails into this. And, and uh, uh, yeah, I think that that's, I mean, I, as you know, I, I um, don't grade, I haven't been grading the exercises. I've been just 
Um, I've been giving feedback and just checking whether it was done or not. Uh, to tr again, I was so anxious to eliminate the fear of a low grade on the first time through that I eliminate grades entirely. I'm not sure that's necessarily the, the right solution, but I, so that's what I attempted. But th what that does do is it shifts a lot of pressure onto the second shot, which is the exam. And so I think that thinking about how grading would work is one of my, you know, one of my issues. Yes. Do you frame your philosophy about failure in the same way that you did today to your classes? I, I'm curious because of what you mentioned about the trust issue that emerges. And it seems that I also teach courses in which trust is, is central to people taking risks. And it seems that failure is at the heart, so, so profoundly at the heart of our human condition um, that, you know, so we not just something that we can take on objectively. It's, it's so subjectively conditioned right. by the time we get to college that it seems that you have to work at really getting people to believe that suddenly you're serious about changing yeah. the attitude toward failure. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it goes against you know this conditioning of 18 years. Right, or 20 right. Years and that, that's back to my, that's my K through 12 complaint. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I, I think you're right. And, and one of the, the difficulties, and it's part, I mean, I can also blame the quarter system now. I mean, there are a lot of things <laughs> one can blame here. But it is, it is very, very hard. And it is not something, what I have learned is that, in fact, this can't be approached intellectually. In other words, I, I can, I've given variations of the speech, both one-on-one -on -one and to the group. And I've, I've tried various sort of verbal, intellectual ways to talk about this. And I, I'm not convinced that it, it I mean, it, it certainly works in some cases, but you're right. I mean, it's so individualized and, and it's such an emotional response that I, I think it requires a different kind of trust building. And I, I'm still trying to figure out how to do that within the context of a one quarter, you know, required senior course in engineering, for example. Um, so. I think one of the, I mentioned that this works with, with it had, I've had more satisfaction and more sense of success uh, with freshmen. And that, that in, in, from Ed's question about feedback, is I, you know, the freshmen will come back, you know, they come back to me as juniors and seniors, and, and I do get a sense, you know, I get a, a, a little longer term sense at least. And that's, that feedback is very positive. But in, in those experiences, uh, we've, in a sense, we've started closer to zero, and um, I think there is a, um, a more deliberate attempt. Um, in my case, it's, it's somewhat unconscious, but a more deliberate attempt to come to terms, to come to emotional terms. Um, whereas, with I think with seniors, both both sides have more built-in emotional barriers established. And it is trickier to figure out how to work around them. I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think just to add to that, Dave, that when you're one person doing this and students are facing a very different situation in their other courses, that it's, it's extremely hard to get them to believe that yeah. this one class can be so different. And of course, when you're at a place and you've gotten used to a certain way of doing things, and I'm sure this is one reason why the freshmen react so differently than the yeah. seniors. Um, they, I'm sure they're somewhat suspect. But if I could uh, just mention in passing that um, there was a, an experiment in Hum Bio with the whole issue of problem sets. Mm -hmm. And the same students over three quarters, because it's a they have that, sequence, yeah. They had one quarter where problem sets were optional, one quarter when they were turned in but not graded, and another quarter when they were both uh, turned in and, and graded. graded. Mm -hmm. And students did vote for the grading. Mm -hmm. There's something, I think again, mm -hmm. after, by the time you spend a year or two around here, you it's almost like getting paid. You want that yes. return on your investment. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And that, you know, that's right. I, another interesting feedback I get, I'm not sure <coughs> student, but uh, one of the things that has changed since I've started doing that is that more students um, think that I'm not working as hard. <laughs> no, I'm serious. They write little notes saying, you know, uh, he's not grading. You know, 
And so it's very interesting. It's very interesting. Um, so, but no, I, I think you're right. I mean, I, that was a little flip, but it's true. I, I mean, that's, I do get that feedback. But um, I, yeah, I, the grading system is tied into this. There's no question about it. And the, I mean, I, I'm willing, at the risk of um, turning this into sort of a circus, but I'm willing to argue that part of this is the fact that the, the BS, I mean, um, has become commodified. I mean, the, the bachelor's degree is, is something that you complete uh, now. And, uh, and so there is a focus on uh, you know, keeping going. Uh, and I think the grading system fits into that as well. And, and so it's, it, is, it is difficult. I mean, uh, um, uh, but, but you know, I have a lot to learn. But I, I, I'm, I'm still not convinced that, that skipping that process of learning from mistakes uh, is not in the end. Um, a problem. Certainly, um, the feedback, for example, since, I, since engineering has associated with it a, a profession out the end, um, we get another kind of feedback, which is the feedback from employees of, of Stanford educated engineers. And, you know, one of the big the feedback loop there is that um, the way that gets articulated is that students aren't practical enough. You know, they, but what they mean is, and, and I've probed this a little bit, I'm still collecting information, but when you sort of probe it, it in fact is right back to this. They, if, they, if they don't get it right the first time, they don't know how to back up and figure out how to start again. And the ones that really succeed are the ones that, get, that do get that. And our students are so smart. And this is not something that's hard to figure out, but if you don't have the experience, there are skills associated with that, I think. I mean, there are skills associated with knowing how to vary parameters and see and determine which is the best choice. And there are skills of knowing what's the best way to test this so that you don't damage something real. I mean, and those skills, I think, um, are the same thing is true with how, you know, with learning. It's what, you know, how can you, you know, where, where should you push? You know, where should you go out on a limb and see where it gets you? And, you know, what's wrong with trying going down this avenue? And, and uh, that's, I mean, there's a, even an analogy, I've talked about this with a couple of mathematicians, when you're trying to solve a really complicated equation and, you know, do you, do you sort of have to know the end point before you start down a path, a solution method, or, you know, how far do you go before you say, whoops, you know, I got to back up and go this way. And so there's a, that's once again, there's a trial and error process that, that is either, con it's not always conscious, I mean, it's not always conscious, but it is, that is what's going on, I think. I do think your notion, though, of trying to set up a situation in engineering and the sciences more analogous to the, what you have in the humanities where you do a draft, I think is very intriguing. It, it might also be relevant that uh, in psychology, at least here on campus, they've experimented a lot with mastery learning, which does mean if you take an exam and mm -hmm. you take several, you take one every week, and you fail something on the exam, you get to immediately read it. Right, right. And so there's maybe the question, too, maybe students would believe it if there were somehow a situation where they could fairly quickly retake rather mm -hmm. than waiting until the end of the quarter, mm -hmm. and if that counted. Yeah. Uh, but I think that's a very but, intriguing notion. But why do you think it is that, that the idea of drafting and redrafting a paper is, is reasonably comfortable, I think. I mean, it, it, my sense is that that's a comfortable process, but it doesn't translate. And, and you know, I, I, that I find interesting. Yeah. One approach that I've seen used in an undergrad class in our department, management science and engineering, was they do the problem set the first time, it gets graded. They lose some points. And they can turn it back in and get, mm -hmm. say, half the points back or something. Yeah. So it's sort of a draft, but it's still graded. Right, right, yeah. No, that's, that's another approach that, um, that I think is, is worth exploring and worth developing. Um, as long as the turnaround, you know, that I, again, it, there's this whole issue of getting it back when it's still the focus of discussion. So another whole issue is the value of classroom discussion of problem sets, which I didn't talk about explicitly. <coughs> I'm, I haven't quite learned how to do that very well yet, but um, uh, that's the other part of the feedback loop is whether just written feedback and, and redoing or whether there's really value in discussing. There's that whole issue then, of course, of not only is it fear of failure, but it's fear of failure in front of colleagues. Um, <laughs> that, and so the trust issue is not just you know, one student and the instructor. It's really the trust of the whole group. Um, 
And that's, that's really tricky. You know, I, I, I understand that. Do you think that part of the reason why the writing model, draft and rewrite, has not been widely accepted is they worry about content? In order for you to take time and interact and close that feedback loop, you made some choices in your class, and things that used to happen are probably not happening. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, a, that's a very big dilemma. I mean, that is exactly right. And that's this, you know, I. Um, I've never been a fan of the quarter system, for example, <laughs> uh, but this, I, I really perceive it uh, because that short timeline and, and expectations, I mean, in, in engineering, if you have a course that's called hydrology and water resources, there is an expectation when that person goes to professional practice or goes to graduate school, there is an expectation of content. <coughs> and what the, 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 the wonderful thing about Stanford is that um, you can trust Stanford students to be able to learn on their own, um, uh, and uh, sometimes sort of cover cover content that might not get covered in class later in life. But I just think we could be much better at helping them learn how to do that. You know, and uh, so you know, raw brain power works, but skills help. Uh, so uh, I'm I'm really interested in that skills part of it. So you had another comment? I just wanted to say that the reason I think that students are comfortable with the draft and redraft process is that it's about improvement. It isn't though the first paper was a failure. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. The second pair of papers better. A bit better. Yeah. No, no. That's. I think that's a very good point. That's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah. I, and that's. I mean, another whole thing about engineering and sciences is a, that. There is a tendency to structure because of the for ease of grading. There's a tendency to structure exercises so that there is a right answer. The problem with with real engineering is that there aren't right answers. There are there are in fact better answers and worse answers. That's another one that just talking about it doesn't work. You know, I I go through that little that that song and dance. And it, you know, it's not one of those things that's easy to deal with as an intellectual concept. But in fact, in spite of all these problem sets and all the physics classes and the math classes and everything else that we take, statics, fluid mechanics, uh, where you do all these problems with right answers, design doesn't have right answers. It has better answers. Um, and so uh, that's why design is fun. I mean, I think that's why everyone should be an engineer. But um, um, actually, they should not be an engineer. They should have engineering education. Yes. yes. I think you stumbled into a cultural, sh generational kind of a shift. I, I have uh, been alert, suspicious for a long time about this issue, and I asked a whole room full of graduate PhDs in physics one time, <clears throat> which one of you can explain to me what the, is the meaning of heuristics? <laughs> and uh, none of them knew what heuristics means, except one British. So it has to do with the fact that people are not in the sciences aware of what their processes are. Yeah, yeah. Murray Gelman was on the book notes recently, and I had to laugh because he said uh, why scientists don't consider the processes that they use. He says, well, the answer is that it's the same reason that birds are not interested in ornithology. Right. No, no, that, that's, that's uh, yeah, I actually saw that, uh, that quote, uh, which is a, a nice one, but uh, and since I'm a birder, I really paid attention to it. But, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, we, we are, I mean, one of the interesting things about, about seriously getting after learning as a subject of inquiry is to, to realize how unself-aware we are about our own intellectual processes and about our own knowledge acquisition and learning. I mean, we are remarkably unaware of it, how we work. It's worse now. In the medieval era, you know, they made a lot, a big thing about inductive and deductive thinking patterns. And right. So on. That, no, that's right. It just doesn't go on anymore. Yeah. Yes. Well, how do we move toward a huge emphasis on product over process, or the point of taking Great. Yeah. And how it looks like transcripts. So the seniors get much more interested in transcript management. Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah. Very risk averse. Yeah. That's what I mean about commodification. I mean, I agree with you. I, I and I don't want to make it sound as if I'm accusing students of anything. It's just I think that the nature of our society and our economy is such that we we in fact have created a set of incentives 
that really focus, you're right, exactly, on, on sort of the commodity value of grades. And as standardized testing catches on more and more in primary education, uh, yeah. it's oh, going yeah. to get worse. Oh, we could really go have fun with that one. <laughs> I know I agree with you. Right? Yeah. Yes? I have uh, <coughs> sort of talked about two things. One is that um, Stanford students probably don't have that much experience with failure, and um, so it's hard to learn how to maneuver after failure. And so I'm sort of like, two, two ideas came to mind, like can you construct an exercise where it's so challenging that everyone fails and then you can have sort of like this outpouring of failure consciousness raising. <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah, yeah. Or, or give examples, or have, or in terms of have a example of you failing in front of them, have one of your colleagues come in and yeah. and put you on the spot where in a place where you don't know and you're uncomfortable and failing. Sure. Yeah. Maybe no, maybe. actually, that's that's very good. And actually, I I um, uh, I I do um, I do I have several exercises I use, and that's part of the goal. Um, in in several classes on the first day, I have and these and whether this actually I've used this with um, freshmen and seniors. Um, I will come in and, and divide them into groups and give them a pound of spaghetti and some tape and have them build something. Right? And inevitably, they all fail. I mean, <laughs> I mean, they all fall over. They all, they all, I mean, like one of them, you know what a cantilever is? So it's a structure that sticks out. You can hold it down and it sticks out like that. And, and it's supposed to, you know, the better the cantilever, the, more it, the longer it is and the farther out it goes. And they all start the project, and I ask them right now, what do you, th you, know, what do you think you're going to get? And they all have this vision of this, you know, this thing like this, and it ends up being about that long, and it falls. <laughs> and so they, they do. They all, and it, it is, it, that, that creates, it's very interesting, because they, it creates a great esprit de corps. In fact, what, what I've learned, what works, is that it, that's one of the best ways of getting the group to sort of be less self-conscious in front of each other. It does. It hasn't solved the you know the professor student thing so much, and I do try to fail um, in in front of students for exactly that reason. 